Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 128 of the Effort Report, which is pandemic episode 16. I'm Elizabeth Matsui. I'm here with Roger Pang. And our tentative title is Money in Academia, Real or Fake? I'm excited by this topic because I have no idea what it means. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I do either. Oh, you're gonna help. You, no, you're, you're you're gonna help me sort this out. This pressing question. I just want to note that uh, when you put the outline up, you actually said it was pandemic episode 15, and it's 16. Uh, and uh, but I can understand that you lose track of time and space in a time like this. Right, and not to mention, we talked about this earlier. I'm recording from the Pacific time zone, which means that. It means that I've been, well, I'm not on vacation. <laughs> I'm working from the Pacific time zone. So I feel a little bit like I'm camping because meetings that start at 8 a.m. Central time where normally I am start at 6 a.m. this time, um, which requires me to sort of roll out of bed and throw on a sweatshirt and then log into Zoom. So it's kind of that, that I don't know, you know, ha- non-showered feeling. That's probably TMI for That's a audience, lot of information. But, yeah. 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 I think the listeners want that, though. So You think they want that? <laughs> no, they don't. No. <laughs> no. So we have some follow-up. So do you m- remember we talked about, um, maybe it was the last episode, about the reply all to decline being able to attend a meeting because, yes. oh, I have this very international Im- committee of internationally important people. and That was your pet peeve from the last episode. That's right. So... Lucy essentially um, wanted to know whether the pet peeve was the reply to all or citing any excuse. And so we just had a little bit of a back and forth about that. Um, So I had to clarify that I think they all came together. But for me, it was really about the uh, sort of nauseating self-promotion excuse that was provided pomposity of it right yes yes so i don't know if you saw that exchange but i missed that exchange but i now looking at it i see that i think she was in favor of the emily post segment right we talked about well no we talked about was it just a segment i think there was an exchange about maybe there needed to be a whole podcast about oh like a emily post like etiquette for academia podcast yes uh, well, how about you be in charge of that? We'll just, well, we'll, you know, we'll just put that out there. If someone wants to make that podcast, we will support it. Yeah. Go for it. We could, ha- we could have a segment on our podcast that's like the Emily Post segment. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Do you th- I think it would have high overlap with uh, Elizabeth Pet Peeves. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. They're the same thing, aren't they? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. All right. We had another small um, item, which is... That I don't, have you ever sat on study sections for like networks or consortia or these like big multi center type of deals or you know program projects that are not multi center but there's like a flavor to these which is like there's a way to write them and there's sorts of certain types of like institutional resources you need to be able to point to and describe and yeah I, I know what you're talking about because I've been on the grant side of that but i've never sat on a study section that reviewed these types of like these these kinds of network like i've been on a study section that reviewed like large grants like large center type grants but there's uh, like another category of this that you're talking about which is like they're kind of in a network together and they're linked and it's part of a huge like centrally directed program and this has a different vibe to it my guess yeah and it, it just sort of struck me that You know, I always have understood that having being at a place that's had experience doing those obviously is a leg up. But I think for these particular grants, including the network ones and this like center and program project ones, um, the kind of handicap that you're given being in a place that has these sorts of you know, environmental, environment and resources, but also experience matters a lot. Um, a lot more than I think if you hadn't sort of had the experience of sitting on these study sections, then you might appreciate. Yeah, I totally agree. And because there's so many different aspects on these huge applications. And I think um, if you've been in it also you also you know, have relationships with people at the other centers with the program officers at the nih or the funding agency and it's just there's a whole set of kind of like activities i guess 
Right. And some of them, I think, are not like you can scrutinize the RFA to the extent, you know, that can, it could be scrutinized. And there's it's just impossible to even write down in an RFA kind of whatever the issues are that, you know, if you've had experience doing those things that you've grappled with um, or that the network has been grappling with um, and that you just can't you can't compensate for that, really. Um, and I have noticed that sometimes an RFA is put out separately seeking new, you know, centers or n- new members of a network. And I'm in I'm in favor of that sort of approach because it sort of levels the playing field. Yeah, I agree. I, I think one of the downsides of these kinds of I, I think they're becoming. <laughs> My sense, based on no data, is that they're becoming more common. <laughs> uh, these kind of like networks of centers um, is that they tend to be quite clubby. I feel like, um, and, and I think it just makes it that much harder to kind of like if you're just interested in kind of doing research in this area to kind of like cre- spin up a center along these lines because it's like it's a little bit of like, well, who are you? You know, right? Well, and I, and I think actually clubbiness is bad for impactful science. I mean, and there's, I think there's some evidence out there, right, that having a diversity of people at the table leads to more impactful work. And so you can kind of have this clubby sense and it, and it probably becomes, you know, the longer that an entity like this exists, it probably becomes more and more clubby over time in us. I mean, for sure. yeah, Yeah. 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 And I think, but it's a natural byproduct of like, I think it's a natural byproduct of national centrally directed research programs that are kind of very tightly controlled, you know, at the top. So advice related to this, um, would you say don't bother applying? No, I would. Well, that's a tough one. Yeah. I, in my experience from the other side, and not me, not on the review side, but just on the, just applying for these things. I mean, there is an element of size that matters, I think. Um, and if you can team up with like a institution that maybe has uh, more credit, so quote, quote credibility in this area, that would, could help. Um, and, uh, I think, um, these kinds of things, I feel like there's been like a uh, inflation is not quite uh, escalation maybe <laughs> of like how involved the, like, like are, there's a kind of a sense of like, are you marshalling the entire university's resources for this, for the, for this one center, you know? And if, and if you're not, then like, what are you doing, right? Right, right. There, I, so I think if you haven't done this before, you might not understand the scale at which some of these things kind of operate. So, like, I, I can't remember which center we were. It was, uh, I can't anyway. I can't remember, but it was like the provost of the university was was like was like essentially organizing the application for the center, um, and it's like that never used to happen before, and now, but now it's like these things are like university wide efforts, um, and so if you don't have the ability to kind of marshal those resources, then it's not going to look quite the same. Right. I like the idea of if if you have a partner that's experienced, that's in some reasonable geographic proximity, trying to, you know, to partner with that person. Um, but I think you have to think long and hard about whether you can be competitive before applying for one of these things. But from like an early career faculty perspective, I think this can matter a lot, especially if you're an MD, um, because you know federal funding is so hard to come by, and these kind of centers, pr- program projects, networks are um, kind of great infrastructure. They can be great infrastructure for an early career person to kind of be embedded in. There's a bit of a catch twenty two in that. Um, They're very top heavy and senior people. Um, And so it can be hard to kind of spin off something that's your own. Um, So you give up kind of the ability to innovate and have autonomy for some level of uh, security and um, visibility amongst sort of the community of people who are going to be assessing your work in terms of, you know, papers you're publishing, your promotion and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think there's a general notion of stability. You know, it's just like it kind of when you have these lar- when you're embedded in these large centers, there is an 
there's a certain amount of stability that you get both from funding and also just from the kind of environment of people that is helpful. I don't have anything else to add. It's just, was on my mind. So I thought I would throw it into our outline. <laughs> I mean, I think I think one of the issues I think is that in terms of budgets going, you know, for the funding agencies as they get smaller, they these programs tend to be in some it's, it's ironic because it's like as the budgets get smaller, the programs tend to get bigger in some sense, like and more centrally directed, like they'll have you know, because I think it's it's easier to fund like five huge centers actually than to fund like a whole bunch of small individual grants, right? Uh, and so I think there's going to be a trend towards. I think there's going to be a trend towards more of these things. But all right, we'll keep an eye on that. Now you're going to be forced to like scrape the NIH reporter data to, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> to back up your claims. Well, I, I could say from my personal experience, you know, we I've been involved in this in the EPA's uh, you know particulate matter research centers for since almost since they started like 2000, and um, and you know every, part of it, so the funding kind of went down every every round there were five year centers right and uh and at every so at every kind of at every stage they they got like each center got bigger and bigger right cuz cuz all, all the everyone kind of merged together so like in the final stage is what we have right now each center is like a is a combination of no less than like seven universities you know and it's just like oh wow and it's just cuz like it was it was a kind of a bigger is better mentality in some sense right i mean but anyway this is the last year so <laughs> There's no, there won't be like one center that has every university in the country. I was going to say, yes, which essentially just becomes what it was originally then, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And so they're not being, they're not being re-offered. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. All right. Calendar filler. I think I might know what this is about. I, I learned something new about myself this week mm -hmm. that I play. So you know how in the Academy Awards, you watch the Academy, you ever watch the Academy Awards? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they have like a very nice audience there and they film it, you know, in the theater. Uh, but like, you know, they like to have, they often shoot like, you know, the audience, you know, they show pictures of the audience or, and, and they don't want there to be empty seats. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they get these th people called seat fillers, uh, who just like sit in the empty seats until whoever was originally sitting there comes back. So like if someone has to go to the bathroom or whatever, take a phone call, then there isn't an empty seat there. So the audience always looks like it's full. Right. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah, so um, also because I imagine there's like this boring parts, right? <laughs> Not everyone right, wants right. to stay the whole time, right? So anyway, the seat fillers are nicely dressed, you know, and they they fill the seats, right? So I am, it turns out, a calendar filler, and what that means is that, and uh, sometimes, so this is only relevant to people whose calendars are accessible by like other people, like assistants or whatnot, right? Like like you, right? Right, right. And uh, sometimes you want to put something in the calendar to like block out a time, but you can't say what it actually is, right? Right. Like what you're doing in that time. So, so I found out that one of my our colleagues that yes, you know, I both not work me, week, it's not, not me you, for the record, a colleague of ours uses me as that like representation. So I am the person in her calendar that's like hiding her, her secret activities. And the, let me ask you this because you sort of had mentioned this to me. So did you find out about this because she emailed you and said, I can't figure out whether we really have a meeting or not? That's exactly what happened. Yes. That's what I would have predicted. <laughs> so what happens now is that you've you've replaced one problem with a different problem, <laughs> which is like remembering which meetings with me are fake and which ones are real. So I, I just want to say that I'm happy to play this role. Like if one of our listeners wants to use this, use me as their calendar filler. I think I'm like go I'm okay it. with it. Yeah, go for it. I say. And you're and you've had practice doing it. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm apparently really good at it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, so if you're gonna go like rob a bank or something, you know, put my name in the calendar. Right. Well, and I was telling my family about this, and they didn't understand why there wasn't some like that 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 this problem. They were laughing because they were like, well, of course this problem then came up, right? Because this is a person who normally has meetings with you. Right. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> and so they thought that, you know, there there should have been some sort of like embedded code where if the meeting, you know, if it said Roger D. Pang or something, then that was a fake meeting. And if it said Roger Pang, it was a real meeting or vice versa. <laughs> yeah. But then it's just like, then you just have to remember the code, right? <laughs> yeah. But, you know. I, th I think you could remember that, maybe. I guess it would never occur to me to put a person's name 
you know, in the slot. Like, if I wanted to, like, I, I would just come up with something cryptic, you know, that's not a person's name. Right, right, right. right. And then I would have to remember, like, what that thing was. But at least I wouldn't be, like, <laughs> thinking, oh, my, oh my, you know, I have to have a meeting with this person and I forgot about it, you know. Right, right. So. Yeah, I don't think I've ever done that either. I mean, I, I agree with you with the idea of, like, okay, I'm, I'm having a meeting about research. Research meeting. Something generic. Something, yeah, generic. Exactly. That's it for that topic. All right. Uh, and then the last thing is that uh, I got a grant score, a grant back. Uh huh. So this was a grant that I submitted in June. I think it was, yeah, end of June. Uh huh. And it was an R25, which in NIH lingo means a grant to develop kind of training materials. Uh, and this was specifically an RFA for training materials in reproducible research, uh, which I think people are in favor of in general these days, right? So it got a 32. Oh, that's a, you know, that's a respectable score. That's much better than my 43rd percentile 49. <laughs> so so this is all the information I have about this grant right now. So this grant was basically like we're going to build the training module that, that was like going to be online materials is going to be actually I put some podcasts in there actually. Wow. Um, and uh so that's kind of like the gist of the grant. And uh, most of the grant is just for developing the materials. Um, so it's like a three-year grant, I think, is what it was. And the study section was very small. I think it had like eight or nine people. There's no percentile because it was like an ad hoc study section. Um, so the score is all I have. Well, and then you'll get the um, summary statement back. Yes. I'm, uh, I'd say I'm cautiously... Dare I say this out loud on the podcast? Go for it. I'm cautiously optimistic. With a thir- 32, you're cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Is that surprising or what? what uh, I don't understand your response. I, with a 32? It's, you think it's too low? Um, you mean like it's not good enough? Yeah. I think it's not good enough. Like I, my sense is that like for grants to be funded, they need to get like ones and twos and mostly ones. I think that's true in general. The reason here, let me explain my reasoning here. So, so in the past, like a thirty-two is a fundable score in the sense that, like, I don't think there would be a, like a congressional investigation if a score with a thirty-two got funded. I mean, a grant with a thirty-two got funded, um, because I've seen it happen in the past. I've seen I've seen grants with worse scores get funded, um, it, it, under various mechanisms, obviously. Um, so I think it's like within the range of like passes the laugh test, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The other thing I would say, there's this RFA. First of all, the grant's not for like a ton of money. Second of all, the there were like seven institutes that went in on this RFA, uh, and there was like a total of maybe twelve or thirteen grants that could be funded. I think. Okay. Um, and given how small the study section was, like I didn't get the sense that there was like a maybe my feeling is that maybe there weren't a ton of applications. That's always helpful. Yeah. So it could be that they just decide, you know what, no, all these are horrible, so we're not going to fund any of them. I mean, that's totally possible, right? Like they don't have to fund them really. Um, but uh, that's the only reason I'm thinking, well, maybe, but we'll have to see. All right. I, I should be cautiously optimistic with you. I shouldn't be so negative. <laughs> I mean, I can understand why you would feel that way because I think under normal, usually I would feel that way too. I, if I submitted a, like an unsolicited, just regular R01 application, I got a 32, like I wouldn't even think twice about it. I'd be like, obviously it's not going to get funded. Um, so, but this being a special mechanism and having some actual money dedicated to it, I feel like there's a chance. That's good. Congratulations. On what? Just on my hypothesis? <laughs> You get to, you get congratulations for that on All a right. respectable score on a good score. <laughs> well, that's my interpretation. I get you're congratulating on my you're congratulating me on my interpretation of the score. Is what you're saying? It's sort of like um, congratulating you on the uh, on your interpretation of the outcome of the election. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not let's not go there. Let's not All do right. that right now. Yeah, we won't do that. Yes. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth's pet peeves. I may have said this, and this may be. In the past, maybe I was more specific about it. Uh, the, I, this is the forest versus the trees pet peeves. So nothing drives me crazy. That's I'm probably being hyperbolic here. There are a few things that drive me as crazy as particularly when there's like, you know, 
a deadline or something needs to be pulled together of like hand wringing um, over trees when the forest is not yet all, you know, kind of laid out. Well, wow, you really so, took that metaphor all the way. Yeah, all the way, right? <laughs> like, and I guess this goes back to, I think I talked about this on a previous podcast, but like worrying about whether the timeline that you're submitting for your grant, you know, has a pretty Gantt chart format with, you know, hot color that's color coded or not. That's a tree. You don't think that's like part of the forest? Well, it's a tree, so it's part of the forest, but it's still a tree whether or not it's got highlighted colors that's formatted in, in an extra fancy way. Okay. Like at some point, that stuff's not going to make a difference in whether it gets funded or not, right? Yes. Like the things we obsess over, and it's not just about grant writing. I'm just thinking about this now because I've like written way too many grants in the last few months. But like, it, it's so tempting to start to obsess and hang ring and perseverate over these things that don't really matter. And I think it can also be, I, I should add a little bit of nuance here. I'm also have this other project that I think people could accuse me of perseverating over the trees and not the forest. But I'm going to defend myself on this one, which is that Sometimes the trees are a symptom of a larger problem in the forest. Wait, hold, now I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, no, you're totally confused. So in one case, right, like um, it, this is a detail that really is not going to matter in the end. And then in another case, there are details that do matter. Because if your in is off by three, it could tell you something that is problematic with the data set. But it feels like a, a potentially trivial, irrelevant thing. So I'm going to update my pet peeve to not being able to distinguish between important details and unimportant details. Okay, I, I agree with you there, but I think that is a actually a challenging problem. Okay. Um, like not knowing what situation you're in can be is hard i think when you're in it right <laughs> well for sure you have to have experience right yes yes and so the other clause here is is a like if you came to me and you were freaking about out about whether there was a gantt chart with highlighted you know rows that were you know had a pretty color scheme i would be irritated you should know better than that Okay. You're like a, you I'm know. I'm taking notes. You're taking notes. So I agree that this is not something, like this is something that you acquire over time, this knowledge, with the, you acquire it with experience. And so my pet peeve applies to people who should know better. Okay, got it. Well, because I think, you know, going back to our previous conversation about like the center grants and stuff, like this is the kind of thing that might appear like in a call for applications, right? Like one of the requirements is that you have to have like a Gantt chart or something like that, right? Which is like, I guess, does everyone know what a Gantt chart is? <laughs> I didn't know when I started, so maybe I should. It's, it's just... It's just a timeline chart. It's like a, yeah, it looks like a table that has like bars that go across that show like how much time you're going to spend on certain activities, basically. And, and it's a nice way to like, if you, when you, if you draw a vertical line through the, the table, you can see how many bars you hit at any given moment in time during the project. And if you, and so you can see how many things you're working on simultaneously in any given moment of the project. Uh, and so anyway, that's a Gantt chart. So, um, what am I saying? Yeah, the point is, like, it could be like one of these things where it's like the, the RFA says you need to have a Gantt chart showing your activities, and then to like the to like the uninitiated, it might seem like this is a critical requirement of the grant, right? And like, because it said right there that we need to have it, right? Right, right. right. And whereas uh, you realize, like, from having reviewed these grants, that like often people don't barely even look at them, right? So, um, right. Well, and I would say it's important to have one, but. I mean, if, it depends. I don't know how important yeah. it is to really have one. I mean, yeah. it's depending well, on if the... Well, they, if, they, if they ask for it. Yeah, no, for sure. Of yeah, course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 
always give the, the specifics that they ask for. Obviously, that's all. right. Right. OK. Um, not sure what lesson we learned there, but uh... no, nothing. It's just my rant for, <laughs> okay. the, for the episode. <laughs> We have lessons from space. Yes, I'm so excited about this. I did see, I watched the um, um, launch. Yesterday, yes. The Crew 1 launch, yes. Yeah. So you might go? You might go? I, I might be on Crew 2, yeah. Oh, excellent. No, I, uh, so <laughs> I texted Elizabeth this message that I got over the weekend, which was just like a routine message that, you know, asking me to serve on like a, or asking me to, actually not even to serve, but just to kind of review a study that was being done by this is through the national academies but it's done by nasa to assess like the cancer risk to astronauts from space radiation in kind of like long dura- long duration missions outside of what's called low earth orbit right so basically the idea is that if they're going to send people to the moon or to the Mar- to mars they want to know what's the risk of kind of cancer from space radiation and uh i thought this is perfect for me like <laughs> We have a whole segment on our podcast called Lessons from Space, right? Well, and there are the other perfect parts of it, the environmental exposure piece and the statistics piece. You forgot to say that they were specifically interested in those aspects of your expertise as well. Yes, but that's not the point here. The point is that like, I feel like in order to really settle the, you know, in order to, to kind of strengthen the evidence in a study like this, they would kind of, they would need to send me into space, right? Don't you think so? I think so. Would you... Oh, God, I can't believe I'm going here. You can edit this out. Do you think that you could, like, pass all of the, like, (laughs) requirements? I'll just use the term requirements broadly. Uh, Like, I think if I applied to be an astronaut, I would not make it. (laughs) And and which part do you think would weed you out? All of them. (laughs) All of them? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you look at the people who apply for these things for to be an astronaut, they're like Navy SEALs like or like, right, you know, right, like right, test right. pilots. I mean, these people are high achievers. I'm not a high right. achiever. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, I don't. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I actually I generally don't think I would be would make it. But I think the reasons are because I don't know. I don't know what the reasons are. I probably wouldn't make the physical. That's for sure. Well, but somehow, right, is, is there is it still a thing where like SpaceX and others are, have sold tickets to go up into space? I mean, that's just to like regular people. Oh, yeah. To be like a passenger. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. So, I mean, that's like not real though at the moment. So it's kind of hard to talk about. But um, but yeah, in the future, if you could just buy a ticket for like a million dollars or whatever, or maybe, <laughs> so maybe a little bit less than that. And then go into space. Did you see that Costco, this is a total non sequitur, you can buy a private jet membership at Costco. Really? Yes. I did not see that. I don't go to Costco, yes. so I don't keep I track of it. I don't know. Of yeah, I don't know how I came across it. But um, anyway, it was quite impressive. That doesn't get you to space, but it does get you a private jet. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll look into it. How's that? Yes. Do you do that? <laughs> if they just made the private jet a little bit more powerful, I would be in space, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That was like quite a big detour. Yeah. Well, no, that was my fault for the Costco thing. <laughs> but, you know, I thought it was kind of a novelty. Yeah. So main topics? Let's do it. So we, I think we were talking about peeling the onion, but you had some other metaphor the the idea that like when you're like wrestling doing cognitive wrestling like it has to be iterative iterative and and just like writing a grant you can only compress that activity in um a certain amount of time because it takes a while to like dig down through all of the sort of um cognitive layers of a problem right to understand like how you're going to state the problem, how you might attack the problem, and so on and so forth. And I have been, I mean, I think I've been doing this most of my career, but I i think I see it more now just because I've had more experience, um, which is that that same concept applies when um, there's, when, when engaging kind of an expert collaborator. And that expert collaborator is, you're probably engaging them because you don't have their same expertise. So their their expertise is complementary or adjacent to yours. 
Um, and I find I found that it's important to like iterate there too. Um, and you know, kind of an example would be, um, and I should add another layer. And oftentimes, there's like a cultural or language divide, right? Yeah. So, um, I wrote a sentence in a a grant that we're getting ready to submit, where I said something about how we're going to collect these PM samples um, to inform laboratory-based experiments, um, and that um, there's no formal sample size, you know, about kind of it, it, it related to whether we, how many samples we need to collect to make inferences about PM across Austin, because that's not the question. We're not trying to make inferences with those samples about air pollution and its spatial distribution across Austin. They're being used in this experiment. And so I had a sentence that basically explicated why there was not a sample size Esti- you know, estimate there in that section. It's because we were not trying to make inferences about the air pollution distribution across Austin. And one of the collaborators is a laboratory scientist. And so she has all this stuff written in her section that, you know, I might not understand, but she is like great because she has enough confidence that, you know, she highlights the sense. She's like, I have no idea what you're talking about here. And in terms of like feedback, right? Because um, this was feedback for like the final um, kind of polishing of the grant. And first of all, I think engaging with collaborators in that way where you go back and forth until you kind of peel all the layers of the onion back so that you both have the same sort of understanding um, helps that collaboration be more successful. Right. Um, And it's often hard for people to do because I remember this feeling of like landing in um, a meeting where there were environmental health scientists talking about outdoor air pollution, which I had not even thought about for a nanosecond. And they kept talking about this PM thing. I was like, what what the hell is PM? (laughs) And then they would say particulate matter. And if you're not in the field, you're like, okay matter that is made out of particles like that could be anything like where and how and and unless you you know both people have to be willing to engage but you yourself can engage if you you know find the confidence and the wherewithal to say just because i'm asking about this doesn't you know there's no reason i should know what this is they're speaking in jargon yeah um and so i just thought that that peeling the onion metaphor was helpful in terms of out uh, of thinking about engaging collaborators because I've often seen the opposite where you know uh, I send a grant to a biostatistician and four sentences are added about power or sample size and I just take it at face value even though I can't under and if I can't understand it that's a problem not only for the collaboration but it also is probably a problem for that grant Yes, I, this you're treading in an interesting territory here. <laughs> uh oh, did I touch a nerve? No, I I think people have different views of like. Let's just take the specific example of writing a grant, right? I think people have different views of like what it is that you're trying to do there, right? And in your mind, it's like we're trying to build a team in some sense, right? And the team has to understand each other and trust each other, right? Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. no, no, I disagree with okay. that. Well, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, that's my point. I think some people may disagree in the sense that, like, you know, like, you could see the team as, like, everyone's integrated together and we all work together and we understand, what you, to some extent, what each other is doing, Right. But like, you know, the other view of this is that like we all are independent contractors and uh, you have a job and I have a job and you do your job and I do my job. And I don't understand what your job is. You don't understand what my job is. But whatever, we, we put the two jobs together and they create something, right? You know, like if I buy a computer from <laughs> somewhere, like even if I don't know what a computer, how a computer works, like I just expect it to do certain things, right? You know, that's it, right? So um, 
it's uh there's a so i think there is an alternate view that's like that's very modular i guess is what i would say um and and you put these modules together and you get like a you know collaboration and you must have views on that approach well i I don't think there is a right way because i think sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't right so i think um there's kind of different ways to think about this i i generally like kind of working building a team and having people who work together and understand each other right i think it's more enjoyable right um but i don't always need that right like it's sometimes like if I need to, you know, like if I'm going to do a study and I want to buy data from a, a provider, right? Like a, not a medical provider, but like a data <laughs> provider, um, you know, that's like a contract relationship, right? Like I, I understand, they tell me, they explain that data to me and I buy it from them, right? Whether it might be like, I don't know, HMO data, it might be uh, like pharmacy, pharmacy data, Medicaid, Medicare, that kind of stuff, right? We don't have like, like a great relationship with the people who provide the data, but you know, they're providing something important. Right. But but those sorts of collaborations are, I would not call them really scientific collaborations. They're not collaborations about the idea and the approach and the study design. These are people who like offer a commodity, right? That right. That is fully, you may not understand how it works, but you, you know enough about whether, you know, it'll do the job, right? When you buy the data. Well, another example that might kind of straddle the boundary here is, uh, you know, for like an air pollution study, right? You might, you need, if you're looking at some health outcome and air pollution exposure, you're going to need some measure of air pollution exposure, right? So there might be an air pollution model out there that people have developed that produces like predictions of air pollution concentrations at certain locations and times, right? And so, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon to say, okay, well, I'm going to, let's, let's involve this group over here at this other university that does this. And, and the agreement is they'll give us the, pr- the predictions and, you know, we'll pay for it basically. I mean, through a subcontract or whatever. Right. Um, do you need to know all the details of what's going on underneath there? I mean, as long as they give you the predictions, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think again, if, if the work you're doing allows that to be commoditized and not impact the, um, you know, the, the, the re- product that you're going to get out of the research you're doing, then I can get that because that's sort of packaged up as a product, right? And you can vet it, like you can kind of have a sense that this group knows what they're doing. A gazillion people have published on this. Um, and, and my main question isn't about, doesn't hinge on, you know, the methods that are under the hood. Right. So I think that you could potentially extend that kind of attitude to like everything, right? And some people do, I think. Right. I um, yeah, I don't I get I start to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I think like it's, yeah. I mean like 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 not not like theoretically uncomfortable, like actually uncomfortable. Like am I going to put something out here that um you know, has all these flaws that I'm not aware of because I'm not an expert. Right. Yeah. And you can't really defend it. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you in this. And I think me, I, my approach has been that like, I don't like, I like working with and kind of talking with and the people that are involved in understanding what they're doing. Um, and if I can't really do that, then I feel like it's not probably not worth it. Cause at the end of the day, it's like, if you're going to be doing this research for a while you're gonna have to go back to them and you're gonna have to ask for more and you're gonna have to it's gonna be a relationship at the end of the day and um and i think and if i can't do that or if they're not interested then it's like then usually i'm not interested either and i think you could argue that this is a limitation like it it, it kind of of my approach because it like kind of uh, it uh what's the word it uh it kind of eliminates certain possibilities from my kind of research agenda you know what i mean right Right. And so you prefer if someone wants to engage you on like, what is this actually, you know, what is the statistical approach kind of doing conceptually? And yeah, and vice versa. Like, I'd prefer to work with someone who's be willing to engage like that. Yeah, just because I feel like that's the job. Like, I think, 
<laughs> you know, like that, that is the job, you know, that, that's like the enjoyable part of the job, like publishing papers and writing grants is not the enjoyable part. Um, and so it's, if you can't do that, then like, then what are you, then you're just focusing on the parts that are not fun. Right. Right. All right. That's why we work together. That's it. There you go. <laughs> so, so don't be afraid to ask questions and, and, uh, it's like, I think the only way I think it's, it's, the only way to have like a meaningful um, collaboration with someone outside of your own field. So. Yeah, it does take quite a bit of iteration. I mean, look how long right. you and I have been iterating. We've been iterating for a long time. <laughs> Still barely understand each other. That's right. Um, at least you've learned to draw pictures and not write out equations. <laughs> Which, by the way, in this grant that I'm putting in, there's a there's a damn equation, and it takes up all this space. Is it my fault? It's not my fault. No, it's not your okay. fault. It's one of your colleagues' fault. <laughs> okay. I have to, I'm going to yell at him. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is a problem. The equations, they often, like, take up a line. It's like, you can't spare that in a 12-page yeah, yeah. grant. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad. All right. Let's talk about money. All right. Let's talk about money. Anytime I see dollar signs, I get excited. And that's what's on our outline, $4 signs. It's a lot of money. So you're all excited. So, um, you know, we've been talking about sort of, and at some point, actually, maybe the next episode, we could should come back and get an assessment for from you about the financial state of universities now that time has passed and um, things, I think, I get a sense are maybe not looking as bad, although the pandemic is, you know, really gearing back up again for another wave. But we'll... we'll, we'll revisit that in a future episode. But related to that, like that whole sort of episode that went down and is ongoing, but went down in the spring where people got salary cuts and there were hiring freezes. You know, in that case, like the money is obviously real, right? Like there's no getting around it. At least someone thinks it's real. Yeah. Who's Who, who controls the money. On the other hand, um, you know, the money is also fake in some circumstances. And what I mean by that is, you know, does it really matter, like, whether I'm getting 10% or 12% off of a grant? Right? Like, can I even project whether I'm going to be doing 12% work or 10% work? I don't really think so. I mean, Within some sense, you need to have people supported en enough to sort of, you know, get the work done. But in another sense, there's a part of grant writing that is getting an idea funded and ensuring that the, the bucket of money that you have is sufficient, you know, to, to ge generally, like on a high level, do the work that you propose. Yes. And so there's this. So I, I I sort of think that whether money is real or fake depends a little bit on kind of the circumstances and the stakes in academia. It, is this making sense? Not like, really, like, no. <laughs> no, it's not making any sense. Well, someone you and I both know, and I this was years ago, said, and I quote, in some meeting, like, Academic money is all funny money. Okay. Right? It's all just theoretical. And so you just do what you need to do. And and this was at a time where, like, <laughs> budgetary management in academia was much worse, right? And so suddenly people would realize that they were in the red 50 grand and, like, the department or the school had to bail them out. And I realize that that happens less so. But there is a holdover from that era. Right. Well, okay. I think a statement like that it, it can be interpreted in a number of ways. One of which I don't think is real. One of the I think is real. Like in the sense that like there is real money, right? <laughs> like we're all getting paychecks and stuff. Like so, the money is obviously not funny money. Like it's not monopoly money. It's real money, right? Right. Uh, so, but it is funny money in the sense that like I think that when you go into this job, you kind of or I think this is true like any corporate environment too, which is that you kind of have a sense that like the money is all parceled off and like restricted and 
and like this dollar can be used for this purpose or this dollar can only be used for this other purpose and some money is like that but that's not actually how money is organized in any institution like it kind of like all in a big pot <laughs> like the in like the university's bank account for us for the most part and then the divisions of how the money are organized are all just like on paper right now there are like f- accounts in the accounting system and whatnot so there are some what you might think of as like physical divisions but that can always be transferred back and forth or usually and i think and it's like i think there's a sense that like money is way more restrict more which way more siloed off than it actually is yes yeah, so maybe that's what i'm getting at you're uncomfortable with me throwing out the term fake <laughs> aren't you that's like a that's like a true kind of you know that's like a dean level statement what is feeling uncomfortable about money being called fake in academia <laughs> i'm not uncomfortable as long as you're the one getting the fake money and i'm getting the real money you're getting the real money okay <laughs> so i guess but it was was my explanation there what you were getting at i think so i mean i knew you would do a much better job of articulating it and that is that there are times where um it's important to there's certain contexts when it is important to worry about money and there are other sort of contexts where it's less less necessary to worry about money. And, you know, one of the examples is like those sorts of hammering out the details when you're putting a budget and a budget justification together for a grant, right? Like really what you're asking for is the whole amount of money and it needs to get the job done. And you want to be respectful to your collaborators for sure. But whether there's like $1,500 a year for travel to a conference or 2000 that's all. It all just goes into a pot and you need to just figure out how to get the, get the work done with it. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the reality of it, like, you know, when I get a grant, I don't know how it works at your <laughs> university, but when I get a grant, there's a budget number associated with it, right? There aren't 10 budget numbers, right? There's just one, right? So kind of conceptually, the money just comes in this one bucket, right? And money comes out, I spend it, and and then money comes in from the government each year, right? Um, and there's no like further resolution like below that one budget number, right? And so uh, I remember when I got my first NIH grant, uh, my department chair, I was talking to my department chair and I was saying how like, uh, this is like 15 years ago, so things are a little different now, but um, I was like, I had budgeted for a graduate student, but like there was this postdoc that I really wanted to hire. And I was like, well, you know, I only budget for a graduate student and... And I remember he said to me, he's like, the, the money is totally fungible. <laughs> like, like, almost as if, I think the point he was trying to make is that the, the whole point of money is that it's fungible, <laughs> right? Um, and it's like, you could just spend it. Um, and uh, I think there's, that attitude, I think, was more prevalent then. I think nowadays, I feel like there's there's a general sense of more, uh, like, tracking what you're spending on and whether it meets, like, what you are had intended to spend it on. Um, especially for certain types of grant mechanisms. I think for like R type grants, there's still quite a bit of flexibility. Um, there's like but a, for, oh, sorry to interrupt. There is a difference between like the salary bucket and then the non-salary bucket. Right. Yeah. You can't, but yeah. So you can't say like, I'm going to be, I said I was going to be 50% on this grant and now I'm going to be 5%. Like you can't do that. And you can't, and you can't move salary money to like supply money. Right. But yeah. I think you can if I hopefully I'm not I don't have this backwards, but like you could take supply money and have it contribute towards someone's salary. This is like NIH type rules. So, yeah. Anyway, what was, what was the point of the point of this? Nothing. Was, I was just I was, <laughs> no, I was trying, I was asking myself, like my, oh, okay. the point of me telling my story was that I, I, I the money for at least for a research grant is not like totally you can't just do anything obviously because it's like federal money you cannot sort of like you know book a flight to bermuda right <laughs> yeah unless just you're doing a research clear. study in bermuda right yeah just to be clear like yeah it's yeah it sounds a little bit like we're encouraging people to like commit federal crimes um yeah but. and that's why i wanted to include that disclaimer because i don't we don't have legal representation do we we don't have anybody on retainer no we don't so if, yeah if someone actually follows this advice we could be in trouble yeah but there is a certain amount of flexibility and i think in general at a university um even you know even for something like changing the salaries on an nih grant like sometimes you just need to provide a justification um 
and the program officer can approve it or not. Like, I think I did that once. I did that once on one of my grants. Like, I had to make a pretty big change in effort. Um, and then you have to write a justification, and the program officer has to improve it. But it's not like it's impossible. Right. So. Right. And you can, you can drop your effort by 25%, I think. Again, look it up. But there's some amount you can you can change your effort by without getting an IH approval. Right. There's a, there's a limit. Yeah. All right. So the money's real. It's just sometimes or often fungible. Yes. Yeah. Did you actually? I had thought about this. I know you said that we didn't we weren't going to do this, but I had thought about like a brief update on university finances. But I, oh. I, I meant to bring that up earlier in in like other episodes, but I kept forgetting. If you want to go for it now, go for it, or we could save it. I, I only mention it because um, Hopkins has released information, so it's like you know it's public, um, and uh, I don't know what the situation is in Austin, but uh, for the fiscal year uh, 2020, which ended in June of this year, right? So the fiscal year goes from July to June at, at Hopkins. At Hopkins, yes, and uh, so the, for the fiscal year that just ended this past June, we actually ended up in a surplus. <laughs> <laughs> A, a very small surplus. A very small still, surplus. still. Yes. They are projecting a deficit for the coming year, with the current the year that we're currently in, which is fiscal 2021. Um, they're projecting a deficit that is, who, which obviously this is a projection, so who knows, right? But um, the, the size of the deficit is roughly equal to the amount that was in surplus in this past year. Ah, ah, <laughs> ah. I... I that's the way it always works out. You're sensing a conspiracy theory, I can tell. Yes. Um, so that's the uh, that's the current kind of budget uh, plan, and they're said that they hope to re- re- to lift all of the kind of budgetary um, restrictions, you know, all the kind of cutbacks that they did for this year by the end of this year. That'll be good. And- for us, it was like the removal of the retirement plan match or, or contribution from the universe. So I, I don't know. I actually haven't heard specifically about finances here. And the other thing about finances here, though, is that they're highly dependent on what happens in the Texas legislative session, which um, the legislature here only meets every other year. But and they meet for like five months. It's like truly small government. I, I just find that for a state that's the size of Texas. Oh, it's bizarre. <laughs> so they meet from January to May and they appropriate funds for, you know, state state institutions. Um, but, you know, there's interviewing still going on, hiring still going on. And so it feels a little bit like here, the sense I get, and I haven't seen this in writing, is that Sometimes there is like alarm about financial situations where there's stuff, the hammer comes down, like at Hopkins, right? Like there really was no way, from my understanding of talking to you and other collaborator, collab of friends, there really wasn't a way to hire, even potentially if, you know, you had grant funding, it was almost impossible, if not impossible. There was this retirement cut, which was like, you know, sal- pay cut. And when institutions get worried, but they're not like alarmed, um, oftentimes there are ways, it's not like this blanket um, kind of cessation of financial spending, you know, spending. And so I get the sense here that there are constraints on things, but things are actually, plenty of things are still percolating along that, that spend money. That's good. Yeah. I wonder, is this, so does Texas write like a two-year budget, basically? I assume so. I don't. You know what? This is right up your alley. Can I give you a homework assignment? <laughs> I will look it up. The, the only reason, can I, can I tell you why I bring this up? Yeah. Because one time I was talk, I was at it like a, it was like a presentation by the, by Harvey Feinberg. Do you know who that is? He was the president of the National Academies of Science uh-huh. uh, years ago. No, no, not the, the, the Institute of Medicine. Sorry. Um and he said, if, he, if someone asked him, like, if he could change something, what would it, one thing like about the government? I think, like, what would it be? And he, and it, the thing he said surprised me is that he would get rid of the annual budget, um, and he would move it to a two-year budget. Oh, maybe it was you know looking at Texas. Well, maybe I don't know, but his argument was that like it would, 
it would first of all it would smooth things out right and it also would get rid of a lot of kind of politicking about certain kinds of programs and the budget process like the budget process at the medical school takes a year yeah well in most places i think yeah, yeah right yeah. and so maybe it would then take two years if it was expanded to two years so maybe there could maybe it would be more efficient maybe i don't know i, I i'm obviously very naive about this so i have no right yeah <laughs> all right you have a homework assignment then because you looked into like the endowment and all of that here. That's true. I'm like a t- I'm going to become a Texas expert pretty soon. You are. Then I'm <laughs> going to I'll send you some boots and a cowboy hat. That's right. <laughs> all right. Should we move on to the daily grind? Uh, sure. So for mine, and this is hot off the press, I got the summary statement back just now, like right w- before we were going to record on the grant, the R01 that got the 43rd percentile. So still digesting, but that that's my big daily grind. Okay. Weekly grind. It's weekly grind. It's weekly. I'm like yes. losing it. I think the daily grind at this point might have gone out of business. Sorry. That really? Like, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's a coffee shop at Hopkins. Yes. Um, my weekly grind, I gave two virtual seminars since we last talked. And uh, one was in Scotland, beautiful, <laughs> the Scottish Highlands, you know, um, and the other was in Canada. I tell you, I've been doing a lot of traveling. Lots of international talks. Yeah. This was going to remind me, I think my, uh, you know, I had to give a talk to like this residency research celebration to that audience. And I think it went over well. I got several emails. I was like having angst about like, how do you talk about giving advice? Yeah. And it presumes anyway. So went well, well. That's good. I think so. Yeah. I have to say my experience just in the last two weeks of giving these talks, um, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I, you know, I'm happy to give a seminar. It's no big deal. Obviously, it's an hour out of my day. Um, but like they, you know, usually for these seminars, I guess it could cut both ways. You go there and you beat people and they have an, and like you have dinner or whatever and and they have an impression on you, you know, but these seminars had zero like, and this is not like an insult to the people who were, I just like, like I gave one seminar at noon, I think. And by five o'clock that day, I had forgotten that I'd given the seminar, you know, uh, it's just, a, it becomes like brushing your teeth. Yeah. It was like, oh, I had the seminar. And then right after that, I had to go to another meeting. Like there was, it like, it just passed me by. And so it's, I don't know. I, I'm like, that's, I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. I just feel like. That's not like how it's supposed to work. And I don't know that this is like an equivalent, a, a worthwhile substitute. Yeah. Well, two vaccines are now looking <laughs> like they're poised, right? So true. Although it'll be interesting to see whether people are willing to continue to pay for, tra- you know, people to travel. It, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe we should do it in the future episode implications from the pandemic on academic life. Make a note of that. Like po- post vac, like post pandemic, post pandemic academic life, impl- colon implications. <laughs> like you're telling me how to how to um, punctuate it. Exactly, I'm a micromanager. It's all trees, no forest. <laughs> Damn you! <laughs> Did I write it correctly on our outline? Excellent. Okay, good. I think that's a wrap. Yes, it is. You can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at The Effort Report, and you can email us. Our email address is theeffortreport at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.